Let's bow our heads in prayer. I praise you, Lord of light, for the resurrection promised in your word. Grant me faithfulness unto the last day. In Jesus' name, amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, how many difficult decisions do you have to make during your lifetime, much less during the course of the day? There's a lot of decisions that I don't like to make. They're difficult ones. Say when it comes time to purchasing a vehicle. How do I know that that truck or car that's sitting out there in the parking lot or in the, in the sales lot is one that's going to last. How do I know that I'm not going to buy a lemon that's going to give up after I drive it out of the parking lot or not last more than a year or two? I not only dislike having to consider that, also dislike having to consider the amount of money that a vehicle costs and then to think about getting the billfold or the checkbook out and forking over the cash for that as well. There's a lot of decisions in life. What do I do? You know, do I purchase this house? Or do I take this job? Or how do I make this decision in my family, with my children, with my spouse? Whatever, there's lots of difficult decisions and we don't always know what the right answer is. There were some people that came to Jesus in our text with a question. They had approached Jesus about heaven. They had approached Jesus about eternity. They had approached him about the resurrection to eternal life and they didn't believe. They were a group of people called the Sadducees, a group of religious leaders, which is really kind of surprising, a small group of religious leaders that the Bible tells us that they did not believe there was a resurrection from the dead. And then it tells us that they not only didn't believe there's a resurrection from the dead, but they didn't believe that the 39 books of the Old Testament, or all 39 books of the Old Testament, were God's word. These men, the Sadducees, only accepted the first five, the books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And they said only those were authoritative scripture. And then as time went on, they justified their unbelief in the resurrection because they said, really, Moses, who was the author of those first five books of the Bible, they said Moses never taught a resurrection. And really, resurrection, eternal life, doesn't make sense to us. We can't rationalize it out in our own minds. Because have you ever seen a body decaying in the ground? Have you ever seen anybody get up from the grave? The rational, intelligent, educated mind says that that can't happen. And so they approached Jesus, who had been, who was teaching a resurrection. In fact, just a few days before this, our text today finds us with Jesus during Holy Week after Palm Sunday. Just a few days before, Jesus had raised Lazarus, his friend, from the dead. Lazarus had been in the grave for three days. His body was already decaying, and it was stinking. And Jesus went to that city of Bethany, he went to that cemetery, and he cried out, Lazarus, come forth, and Lazarus came back to life. He came out of that grave. There were hundreds of eyewitnesses, and I'm sure that these very men, the Sadducees, had heard reports, because people were talking about it in Jerusalem during Holy Week, about how Jesus had raised this Lazarus from the dead. And still they had the gall to come to the Lord with a question, a strange one as well. And it wasn't because they wanted an answer. They wanted to trick Jesus. 
They wanted to show the silliness of how the resurrection could never really, really be. Have you had questions like that? When you think about the resurrection to eternal life? When you think about the afterlife? Maybe it's something that we think about if we ever really, if it really gets personal. Maybe it's the loss of a loved one, a parent, a spouse, a child. Or maybe if we're even facing our own mortality. The devil wants nothing more than for us to start thinking to ourselves, does that teaching, does that belief of a heaven really make sense to you? You know, they, I mean, it's, isn't it silly? And it starts to creep up into our minds. Yeah. Is that really true? How can I be certain of a life after death? Jesus shows us powerfully this morning that we can be. That we can be certain of life after death by, take, by first of all, trusting God's power. And secondly, by trusting his pronouncements, his promises. This was the trick, the tricky question, the tricky situation that the Sadducees came to, to, to Jesus with. They said, teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies leaving a wife but no children, his brother should take the wife and raise up children for his brother. So there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and died childless. The second took her as a wife, and so did the third, and in the same way, the seven died and left no children. Finally, the woman died too. So in the resurrection, whose wife will she be? For the seven had her as a wife. The Sadducees come to Jesus with something, with a, a practice that we're not familiar with. In the Old Testament, God had a law called the Leveret Law, which made sure that a man did not ever die without descendants. To see to it that uh, his family name would be carried on in per perpetuity. And this was important because uh, God wanted his people to make sure, these families, to have their own parcel of land and to keep it, be able to keep it in the promised land. That was something that pointed ahead to what heaven was going to be. If you remember Jesus talking about, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going to prepare a place for you. So just as these Jewish people had their own piece of land in the land of Israel, so also every believer has their own spot we can call our own, prepared for us by Jesus in heaven. And so in this illustration on earth, God did not want to have these people lose their place here on earth. And by doing that, if a husband died, his brother would have to father a child for him. So in this silly illustration that the Sadducees give Jesus, they say, look, they tried this seven times and nothing happened. And then this, Jesus, in the resurrection, ha, 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 whose wife will she be? Some might look at this as a legitimate question. Jesus didn't. Three of the other gospel writers also include, or also write about this event. And it's the gospel writer Matthew that says, Jesus, first thing he says is, you know nothing about the scriptures. Okay? He gives a, a word of reprimand to these religious leaders. He says, you know nothing at all about the scriptures. And then he says, first, then he gives an answer. An answer of God's power. First of all, because these people were doubting God's power. First of all, he says, there is a resurrection. But let's, first of all, look and let's just dissect this a little bit. He says, in heaven, there is no marrying or giving in marriage. For we'll be like the angels. So he first tells them, Marriage is not an institution for heaven, in heaven. 
it's something that's for here. So that doesn't apply. And then he goes on to tell them this. He says, besides, you know nothing at all. He says, the people of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to experience that age and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry or given in marriage. They, in fact, they cannot die anymore, for they're like the angels. They're sons of God because they're sons of the resurrection. We're like the angels. We can't die. Those who are worthy to partake in the resurrection are those who are believers. Jesus says there is one. But these people, they distrusted God's power. They distrusted his promises. They couldn't fathom in their mind how this could go because they thought they were smarter than God. What are your views of what heaven are like? I'm not saying, uh, as I've gotten to know all of you here, I know that there's not one of you sitting here in the pew this morning that says, Pastor, there's no resurrection from the dead. I know you're not thinking of that. But there's still a little bit of the Sadducee in us who likes to try to make heaven into something in our own mind that it's not. How often do we look at things like in heaven will look that our loved ones that are up there are looking down on us. And they're, they're guiding us and, and helping us. That's really not what heaven's like. You've got to first of all think about it this way. In heaven, as we heard those beautiful descriptions in the readings this morning, there's no weeping, there's no sorrow, there's no death, there's nothing to cause sadness. What makes us think in our right minds that our loved ones in heaven can look down here and see things and not be sad? This is a world that is full of sin. There are many blessings, but there's still sin here. In heaven, there is none. The Bible tells us the dead know nothing. They can't see what's going on here, but they know and trust that God's taking perfect care of us, just as he is of them. But they don't know what's going on here. You might think to yourself, Pastor, it really, really bothers me when Jesus says, in heaven there is no marriage or giving in marriage. Are you trying to tell me that my best friend, my spouse, and I are not going to have that relationship in heaven? If that's the way heaven is, I don't want, I don't want to be there. Really? I love my wife. I know that she loves me. She puts up with a whole lot more than I do. Okay. This person that I love, who I have my life dedicated to, in heaven, all of our relationships are going to be perfect. Okay, there's going to be no need for, for, for having children, for having families. We're all going to be one family. Everyone gets along. Everyone is going to be happy. We're going to have perfect relationships with everyone. Now that doesn't mean that we're all going to agree on the same thing, or we're all going to like the color blue, or we're all going to like to wear this type of clothes, or do this type of thing. We're all going to be unique, but the relationships are going to be perfect, which we can't even begin to comprehend here. And so, when we hear what Jesus has to say about heaven and eternal life, we need to remember we base, want to base our beliefs on how God describes it for us, not how necessarily our sinful human minds want to make it out to be. And then notice how Jesus crushes the Sadducees' argument altogether. These men who said, okay, we don't believe that there is a re resurrection. We're trying to make Jesus look like an idiot here, and anybody else who believes there's a resurrection. And you might be thinking to yourself too, Pastor, how can religious people go on thinking there's no afterlife? Isn't that crazy? Yes, it is. But we still see people like that today. There are people in the church, in the church, who I've heard say, and I've heard Lutheran pastors tell children, well, Jesus really didn't raise, rise from the dead physically. 
His spirit probably came out of the grave. But that's not really what matters. What really matters is what you make of this life. How you help others. How you leave this world, this creation, a better place when you leave it. You know what? It sounds good and noble. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that. But if that's all there is, it makes our Lord out to be a liar. It makes out scripture to be false. It makes Jesus, 12 apostles, and all of those people who were eyewitnesses to his resurrection to be totally and complete idiots. There is more than what's here. A perfect life for all who believe in Christ in heaven. And so that's why he says, you don't know what you're talking about. And because these men said, we consider to be scripture, doesn't, that doesn't talk about a resurrection, Jesus says, you really think so? Are you that dense? Although he doesn't say it crass like that. But he says, all right, you want to hold to what Moses wrote? Let's go to what Moses wrote. Let's go to the account of Moses in the burning bush. And in the account of Moses in the burning bush, God speaks to Moses and identifies himself. And he says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Pretty simple words. This was written 1,400, almost 2,000 years here before I'm speaking right now. And then he said, look at what God said. Look at what Moses reported. Notice what God didn't say. He didn't say, because he said, weren't Moses, or weren't Moses is in the grave? Weren't Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the grave at the time when Moses spoke? When God spoke? He said, if God's not the God of the, of, if there is no resurrection, God would have said, I was the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. But the God, they're alive because of the resurrection. Moses teaches a resurrection. God teaches a resurrection. There is one. That's the power of God's promises, of God's proclamation. God teaches in so many places, I am the resurrection and life. He who lives and believes in me will never die. It's the Apostle Paul who tells us, if Christ is not raised, you are still in your sins. Your faith is useless. We are to be pitied more than all other people, than unbelievers. But Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have, been, who have fallen asleep. What a comfort that is, isn't it? Today and every day, as we remember the faithful that have had an impact in our Christian lives, People who have shared their faith with us. People who in this life prayed for us, nurtured us, instructed us, brought us closer to Jesus through the means of grace. What a blessed, happy reunion that will be. No wonder the Apostle Paul says that on that last day, that the dead in Christ will be raised first and will be caught up into the air to meet the Lord and his, angel, and his angels in the air. And then he says, and so we will be with the Lord forever. I think those are the most beautiful words in all of Holy Scripture. It's what we all look forward to, isn't it? Not only being reunited with Jesus, but with every loved one who was faithful with the Lord. To spend an eternity with them. All because of Jesus' power. All because of his proclamations. And that's why we are certain beyond the shadow of a doubt that there is life after death. Amen. <clears throat> the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll confess our Christian faith not only in the triune God, but in the certainty of the resurrection to eternal life with the words of the Nicene Creed. You can find them on page 18 in the hymnal. They're here on page 11 and 12 in your bulletin. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. 
We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. At this time, we'll sing the Creator. Thank you. 